Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name's Dr. James Gill and you've joined us for another clinical skills video. Today we're going to be looking over the hip. Now, for a lot of people, the hip is just a joint that's affected by uh, older people. However, that's not the case. And in this uh, video today, we're going to look at the examination of the hip, but we're also going to highlight where we may find injuries or problems with the hip, but also what are the individual parts of the examination we're doing and what's the clinician looking for there. So to start off with our examination, obviously we need to introduce ourselves to the patient. So hello, my name is Dr. Gill. I've been asked to have a look at your hip today. Um, before we go any further, could we confirm your name and date of birth, please? Yes, my name is Megan Struthers, and my date of birth is the 22nd of February, 1998. Thank you. So in terms of having a look at your hip today, that's going to involve you standing up, getting to do a, a, a quick walk. We'll have a look at um, the, how you're standing, and then get you to lie down on the bed, at which point we're going to press around your joint and also get you to do some movements. Is that okay? Yep. Super. So if we can get you to stand up for me. So this is the first part where we're going to actually observe what we can see with the patient. So we're going to have a look at the feet, moving up to the knees, and we're looking there to see if we can see any deformities such as we've discussed in the knee video, such as a varus or valgus deformity. Then we need to go up to look at the anterior superior iliac spine and whether or not these are level. If there's any uh, problems here, then I might suggest that we may subsequently find a leg length discrepancy when we assess the patient further. We're looking up at the hips to see if we can see any abnormal creases and everything looks uh, symmetrical there. Now at this point, we also want to walk behind the patient to have a look at the spine. So if you can move your hair to the front, please. That lets us assess that the shoulders are equal and that there's no signs of a, a scoliosis in the spine, which again might suggest there'll be increased wear and tear on one hip or the other. We also need to look at uh, the lumbar spine. So if we've got an increased lumbar lordosis, if we can. Okay. So with an increased lumbar lordosis, that might suggest we've got a tight iliopsoas muscle, which when we come to looking at the hip, we may find is causing a problem with keeping that hip slightly flexed forwards. As we're doing the walk around the patient, we also need to have a look to see if we can see any signs of ports or scars around the hip or any evidence of wasting to the muscle. Uh, there we might be talking about wasting to gluteus medius muscle, which may um, occur if we've got damage to the gluteal nerve, such as if we've had a hip replacement. Having observed the patient and not being able to see any significant issues, we'd ask them to walk five paces, turn and come back again. As the patient's walking, so we're looking at the normal um, stance phase and swing phase of the legs as we do so, and there's no obvious changes to the hip, so we've got a normal gait there. So we need the five paces to make sure that the patient is getting into their normal gait rhythm, and also we're looking to make sure we've got a normal heel strike and toe off um, routine as we're doing that walk. We may see the abnormalities of gait if we've got, for example, an antalgic gait, so the simple dot dash or painful gait. So seen here, we've got uh, an increase in uh, the stance phase on the good leg, and we've got an increased swing phase on the bad leg as the patient is trying to avoid putting uh, weight or pressure on the affected or painful side. Then there's also a Trendelenburg gait. Um, this is where we have a waddling gait where a weakness on the gluteal muscles will affect the contralateral side, causing a hip drop. So here we've got a weakness on the right hip, causing the left uh, hip to drop down as we're walking. And in terms of uh, looking at the hip, we need to do a Trend Allenbert's test. So if you could just lift up your um, shirt ever so slightly. So what we're looking here for is the anterior superior iliac spines. And I'm going to place my hands either side of that, and then I would like you to raise the leg on whichever side I tap. If you feel unbalanced, please um, you know, steady yourself and we'll stop the test. And what we're hoping for is as you take the weight off one side, we'll actually see your pelvis rise up ever so slightly. Okay, so there's the front of the hip. So if you raise that leg up for me. Okay, so we've got a slight raise, but crucially, it's not dipped down. And put this leg back down, and the same again on this side. Up, and that's fine, and up, back down. Now, if we did have an abnormality, if you could just raise this leg and drop that hip down, there we go. Perfect, and back up. So, 
If we did see that drop, then we'd be looking at a positive uh, trend down at Bird's sign, and we'd be worried that there was a weakness to uh, the, the muscles of the hip, particularly the adductors, such as gluteus medius. So if you'd like to lie down on the bed for me. So at this point, compared to the knee, there's very little areas uh, to uh, palpate. So we want to palpate the greater trochanter on both sides. And if we can find any pain or tenderness, this might suggest a trochanteric bursitis, so an inflammation of the capsule that allows smooth movement there. Whilst we're looking at the hip, we have to appreciate that problems with the hip could relate to the pelvis, the lumbar spine, or the knee. So one of the other things that we can do is we can apply direct pressure to the anterior superior iliac spines to see if that causes any pain to the pelvis. So I'm just going to press on the front, tell me if any of this hurts at all. Okay. Any pain there? No. Okay, so I'm pressing as I'm doing that directly over the anterior superior iliac spines. Sometimes when we do that, we may get pain or discomfort over the anterior of the pelvis, suggesting the possibility of uh, a symphysis pubis discomfort. Now that might be seen if we've had somebody who's uh, overexerted themselves or overtrained, for example, in a marathon, or perhaps if we've got a pregnant lady who um, the joints are becoming laxer as we get further on in the pregnancy, and that will be expected in order to facilitate the birth of the child. And at this point, we then want to check for our leg length discrepancy. So again, we're going to take the tape measure and we're going to measure from the anterior superior iliac spine. We're measuring down to the medial malleolus. So we're seeing a 90 centimetres there. And we'll do the same again to the opposite side from the anterior superior iliac spine down to the medial malleolus. And again, we've got a nice uh, equal 90 centimetres. So that's our true leg length. We're measuring directly the size of uh, the legs. Now that might be changed, that might alter, if for example there'd been a fracture of any of the long bones, or if we've got significant arthritis of the hip. All of that could result in shortening there. Now if we did find a leg length discrepancy during our assessments there, we'd have to ask, where is the problem? So, for example, we could have a, uh, a fracture to any of the long bones, which may result in a true leg length discrepancy. Similarly, a fracture to the hip could cause that, along with severe arthritis of the hip. By comparison, a muscular issue, such as contractions, so iliopsoas contraction or um, a fixed flexion deformity, those would cause an apparent leg length discrepancy. So, in terms of identifying what's going on, we can have the patient roll onto their front. and then have them raise both feet up like so. If we have the knees at a different level, then we can uh, identify that the leg length discrepancy is related to uh, the femur or the, uh, the hips. And if the shoes are at a different level, then we can say that the leg length discrepancy is related to uh, the tibia here. We also need to look for the apparent leg length discrepancy. So if you could raise your t-shirt slightly to get to your umbilicus. Okay. And then we're going to go from the umbilicus. And we're seeing 99 centimetres. And then we're going to the opposite side again at 99 centimetres. So that correlates with what we've seen earlier on, that we've got an equal position of the pelvis, that there didn't appear to be any um, problems with standing. And here we've seen that both legs are equal in length, both of their true and apparent leg length discrepancy. If there was a problem with the apparent leg length discrepancy, that's going to be muscular. So one issue there may be an iliopsoas uh, contraction, whereby you're going to see a slight flexion of the hip. We'd look at the, uh, the patient from the side to see if we can see any evidence of that um, fixed flexion deformity initially, but we will um, then go on to subsequently formally assess it. So we assess for a uh, fixed flexion deformity by doing something called Thomas test. So if you could shuffle up for me and shuffle to the bottom of the bed so your um, knees are here, please. So this is a modified uh, Thomas test. So what we're going to do is, if you lie back now, please. Okay. I'm going to put my hand under your lower back. 
Okay. So I can feel the gap under the spine. The arch of the lumbar spine is still present. And if you take your knee up to your chin as best you can, okay. and as that happens, the lumbar lordosis disappears. So I can feel the pressure on my right hand and the hip here is staying flat on the bed. If you relax down for me, and if you raise this leg up, please. Again, I've lost the lumbar lordosis and the opposite leg has remained flat on the couch. So we know, if you could relax that down, that there's no evidence of a fixed flexion deformity. So if we did have a fixed flexion deformity, we'd see something slightly different during the examination. Then we return our hand to check for the lumbar lordosis. We raise the left leg up. As the lumbar lordosis disappears, the right leg becomes raised because it's not able to actually sit in extension um, and we're compensating with an anterior movement of the pelvis. If you could relax this leg down and this leg, assuming it's unaffected, when we raise this knee up for me, we again lose the lumbar lordosis, but the opposite leg stays intact. The thigh remains touching the bed. So we can see the difference there between the two. If you could shuffle uh, back at the bed. So having done our... So having broken the bed... <laughs> <laughs> so having done that special test, we then want to look at the movements of the leg. Now, if you uh, move your leg as far out as you can, and can we see the pelvis has moved here? So if you come back in again. So we can see whilst there is excellent uh, abduction, excellent movement away from the body, as we get to a point where that movement is taken over by uh, movement of the pelvis as well. So in order to assess the degrees of abduction, we'd again ask the patient to move their leg out to the side. But as they do so, we'll stabilise the pelvis and we'll log how far they've been able to abduct, abduct the hip by the time we get movement of the pelvis. We must stabilise the pelvis and then stop when we feel the pelvis moving. So again, if you can move the leg out, please, and stop. So here we've got a nice 45 degrees range of movement, but I've called it um, as I felt the pelvis moving. And come back in again, and then I come across your leg to the opposite side. And that's fine. So we've got a normal range of movement there. We've got 45 degrees of abduction and we've got approximately 30 degrees of adduction. We'll do the same again for the opposite leg. So if you can move all the way out for me and stop and then come in and come back over, please. Excellent. And return to centre. Thank you. So we've got an excellent range of movement on the opposite leg as well. Again, our 45 degrees of abduction and our 30 degrees of adduction. So that's looked at how far we can move the hip laterally. Whilst our ab and adduction are largely active movements, the patient is doing them themselves, we can also place a hand to the hip and then do that movement ourselves, making sure there's no clicking or clunking as the hips are moving along. And I can't feel any undue stress when we do that. We also have to do another passive test, our internal and external rotation of the hip. So I'm just going to take your leg up and we flex the hip to uh, 90 degrees and I'm externally rotating the hip at this point. We're going to pay attention to where the foot is. When the foot is doing an internal movement, we're doing an external rotation of the hip. And when the foot is doing an external movement, we're doing an internal rotation of the hip. If we get pain at that point, then that may suggest that we're looking at um, arthritis of the hip. And then we do the same again on the opposite side. That internal rotation of the hip causing pain can actually be one of the earliest signs of arthritis rather than just a sign in of its own right. So having done our ab and adduction, we then need to flex the hip. So if you could bring the knee up to your chest for me and back down again. And the same again on this side, up and back down again. So we've got good flexion of the hips, but we also need to have a look at extension. And there's several ways that we can do that. So in terms of testing extension, one way of doing it is to get the patient to roll over on their side. So if you can roll that way for me. You're going to stabilise the hip, and if you could move this leg backwards as best you can, please. So we've got a normal extension there, and back over. We need to do the same again on the opposite, so that's going to involve, again, rolling to your other side. 
and again I'm stabilizing the hip and extend backwards for me. Thank you, and return to center. Now, because that involves two movements of the patient, another that we can do is have the patient roll over on their front. So, in terms of extension in this position, if you just raise this leg up as high as you can for me, we easily get movement of the pelvis as well, which we don't want. So we're going to stabilize the hip and then raise this leg up for me and stop. And the same again on the side and all the way up and stop. So we're doing that extension until we feel the pelvis begin to tilt. That's fine. If you could lie on your back again, please. So two other tests that we can look at. One is the Farber test. So we're looking at a flexion of the hip. We're doing an abduction, moving the hip out, and we're doing an external rotation. And we're putting quite some stress there, and that's going to cause pain if we've got um, a hip, lumbar, or um, a SI joint discomfort. And we'll do the same on both sides, so flexion, external rotation, and adduction at the same time. And you're putting quite a degree of force there to see if you can generate that discomfort. We can also flip it the other way for our Farber test. So flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Again, trying to stress the joint capsule, looking for sources of pain. Okay. So that completes our examination of the hip. We've had an excellent range of movement and no signs of pain or weakness at any point. Do you have any questions for myself at the moment? No. Super. Well, thank you very much for your time. If there's any questions you've got, please drop them down below and we'll see you in the next one. Take care. Cheerio.